morning, church. So good to see you back. I'm still flying high from last week, celebrating 15 awesome years. Thank you guys for all the delicious food you brought. Thank you for bringing your friends. We had record attendance again, and uh, I give God all the credit for, for all the great things that he's done the past 15 years, and I'm very excited about what lies ahead. Today, we are starting a brand new series, and it goes ex exactly what we just sang about the grave robber, and you're going to see why as the next three weeks unfold and people come up and ask you questions. Why do you really believe the tomb is empty? Why do you how do you defend that? How do you explain that? That goes against the odds, right? Not many raised anybody from the dead lately? <laughs> it's... It's kind of foreign, right? That's what apologetics is about. Today we start a brand new series. It's a very cerebral series, but it goes to the heart. And I hope you brought an open mind. It is going to be so powerful. So let me ask you the question. What is it that goes through your mind when you hear that word, apologetics? Right? Be honest. You know it. Just, you don't have to be spiritual. This is what you think of, right? Is it, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. That's, that's what we think. You don't have to be spiritual here. That's what we think of when we hear apology. You're safe here. It's the potter's hand. We can admit that apologetics is a funky word. What does that even mean? Is it the art of apologizing? It's not. Some men could probably use the art of apologies. I know us men, we don't like to say we're wrong, but this isn't the lesson for today. Today we look at an ancient, really it's a Greek word. And what it means, literally, right flat out, is vindication or defense. It's a very simple concept. It goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks where it, even back to Socrates and, and, and Plato, where an accused person would be up on the courtroom, up on the stand, and after he was accused, he had a chance to stand up and literally give his apologia, his defense. He could speak to the facts. He could refute things, and he could say, that's not true. I didn't do that. Here, here's where I was, and here's my alibis, and here's the reason why I'm not guilty. That is simply put what apologetics is. Unless you think I made up the word, I promise, it appears 17 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's a noun, sometimes it's a verb. But every single time it shows up, it means the same thing, vindication or some kind of defense or proof. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 1. He says, because I have you in my heart, you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, my apologia. He goes on to say in verse 116, he says, these preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. It's a beautiful thing. And, and we see this all throughout church history. But probably the best explanation of apologetics and the reason why we should know what we know and why we believe what we say we believe comes from Peter. So turn with me to 1 Peter, pull up your favorite Bible app. We're going to dive in there. 1 Peter chapter 3, and just hold your place there. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. And uh, I've been informed that probably 90% of the people who visit your church check you out online first. That's their first impression. So let me welcome you. If you're checking us out, you picked a doozy. <laughs> Way to go. I hope you enjoy it. I hope God's word speaks to you today. Let me set the context for First Peter here because this is, this is a little strange because Right out of the gate, Peter says something. He says, I want to talk to those people who are pilgrims of the dispersion. What is that? See, what's happening in this moment, this dispersion, it's exactly what it sounds like. Persecution has ramped up big time. In fact, Stephen has just been martyred for his faith. And once that happens, people start fleeing. People are going all over. And they're, they're trying to get out of Dodge because it is getting really, really hard to be a Jewish believer in this day and age. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Thankfully, we're not running for our lives yet, but we do know that things ramp up before the Lord returns. And we look at this and we think, man, Peter is giving him a warning. He's saying specifically to the pilgrims of the dispersion, I'm writing this letter, those of you who are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this persecution is ramping up, and there are people now openly trying to intimidate Jewish believers. They're openly coming against them. Some are trying to do harm to them. So with that as our context, this next verse now really makes sense. Look with me at verse 14 through 17 of chapter 3. It says, Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason you have hope that's in you. 
You do this with smugness and incredible conceit and arrogance. And you use the... Tr- oh, yours doesn't say that? What does it say? Gentleness with respect. Remember this, church. This is so key, and you're going to see why in just a second. Keeping a clear conscience so that when you're accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. That literally means they will be embarrassed that they spoke unkindly of you. Verse 17, for it's better to suffer for doing good, if that's God's will, than for doing evil. Wow, that is so bold. Let's be honest, church. One of the biggest problems with modern Christians sharing their faith today is their lack of biblical knowledge. Not knowing what they really believe, not knowing their core beliefs. They simply can't answer questions that unbelievers ask. So Peter is making no mistake. He is making it crystal clear. Be ready at any time to answer anyone about anything regarding your faith. Be ready. There it is. There's our mandate right here. Be ready at any time to answer anyone who asks you anything about your faith. That's a big charge. So you know I got to ask, as your, as your friendly neighborhood pastor, how you doing with that? If you had to take out your divine holy post-it notes today and give yourself a ranking on a scale of 1 to 10, what ranking would you give yourself today about being able to fulfill Peter's charge, being able to answer? Somebody come and ask you a question, man, you're different. What is up with you? Would you say you're a five? You know? Eight, nine, like, man, I got it. I, I know God's word. I am plugged in. I stand on this. This is my foundation. I've got it. It's, it's, it's. Did you put a, a post-it note of maybe a two on your forehead because you're not quite there? That's okay. That's okay. We've all been there. Hopefully, no matter where you are, you can go up another level. You can take your digesting of God's word to the next level and be able to not only know it, but to explain it. When someone comes and says, man, what is the hope within you? What is that about? I notice your car is never in the driveway on Sunday mornings. And you're not out hanging out all night, Saturday night, doing crazy stuff like my neighbors were last night, and I actually had to get up out of bed and go confront my neighbors. That was awesome. I'm not bitter. <laughs> True story, right, honey? Woo, that was awesome. True story, true story. <laughs> no, it wasn't awesome. They didn't ask me about my faith in that moment. Just wanted you to know that. But uh, <laughs> I would have been prepared to share it if, if, if I was asked. Peter's saying, guys, do you really believe this? In other words, I love this. Do you really believe what you believe you believe? (laughs) It's a tongue twister, but what a great question. Not do you believe what you think you know. Do you really believe what you believe you believe? And do you really believe this book? Do you really believe God created this ex nihilo out of nothing? Do you really believe that all other religions are dead ends and only one man resurrected? and the tomb is empty? Do you really believe that? And if so, can you explain it if someone says, why? Why do you believe that? That's the apologia. That's the whole book. Man, casual Christianity church, let's be honest, it ain't going to cut it anymore. It's not going to cut it. We have got to be people of the word and know this. So here's what we're going to do. For the next two minutes, and two minutes only, we're going to go to seminary class, all right? Yeah, you look as excited as I was when I did that. If I'm going to lose you, it will be in these next two minutes. If you are going to fall asleep, it will be in these next two minutes, okay? So get your thinking caps on. Here's your seminary class. There are four main functions of apologetics. We have to know this before we move on, okay? The first one that all church founding fathers all the way through history seem to agree on is called vindication. This is one of the functions of apologetics. This involves bringing philosophical arguments forward, being able to prove things scientifically, historical, all the evidence for Christian faith. The goal of this function is for Christianity to show that this is the belief system that you need to accept and drawing out all the logical implications. This is a very cerebral aspect of apologetics. This is the one that helped win me to Christ, being a son of a NASA scientist. This is the one that helped bring Lee Strobel as a, as a Chicago Tribune reporter who couldn't stand the faith This is what helped bring him to Christ. This was the, if you saw the case for Christ last year in the theaters, this is the function of apologetics that got his attention. It's that very cerebral scientific base. Show me the data. Show me the facts. Prove to me why you believe this is real. The second one is called defense. This is the second function of it. And this one is probably the one that is closest to what we see in the New Testament. This is the one that the early Christian people always called the apologia. This one right here is where you are defending Christianity against the constant attacks 
that are coming its way, from all of those other varying belief systems. Or you are able to defend it against those who, wait for it, misrepresent what they think you believe. How about that? Those who, oh, you're one of those Christians, you believe, did, did, did. And you're like, no, <laughs> no, I don't believe that. You're one of those narrow-minded <laughs> type people, right? No, no, I actually love, you. you're, you're welcome here. What, what? This is the one that that comes, this is that defense. This is where you answer the objections and the criticisms and questions from non-Christians. Your, your job when you're in this role is to clear away all of the so-called hurdles they have what they give you, their excuses for coming to faith in Christ. And it's a powerful function. This next one is the weakest. This next one is refutation. This is refuting opposing beliefs. In other words, this function focuses on answering the arguments that non-Christians give you, not to shoot yours down, but to support their own beliefs. Now, here's the problem with this one. This is why it's the weakest one. This is just because we can prove their false religion to be untrue does not prove Christianity to be true. Does that make sense? Just because I can shoot holes in your arguments, that still hasn't proved why I have faith in Christ. All I've done is just chisel away their sandy foundation and show that it wasn't built on rock. It's needed, it's important, but it is probably not the one that stands best by itself. And then the last one, see, I told you, it's just two minutes. The fourth function of knowing apologetics is persuasion. Now, I like this one because immediately, the first thing I think of when I hear persuasion is a used car salesman, right? Hey, good to see you today. How you doing? You would look good in this Ferrari. <laughs> I don't know if there's a lot of used car lots that sell Ferraris, but anytime somebody says that, don't you want to say, yeah, I would, and you know what else would look good? A million dollars in my bank account, and I could buy that Ferrari, but they never seem to offer that. This is not what he's talking about. This is not that smooth, slick-talking salesman. This type of persuasion is convincing people Following Christ and applying his truth to your life makes your life better. One beggar telling another beggar where we found food. That is a beautiful method. This is persuasion. My, my job here isn't to win an intellectual argument and to beat you down with facts and figures. My job is to persuade you to commit your lives to Christ, to commit your future to Christ, because it makes it better for you. I came that you might have life more abundantly. Not only in the future, but here and today. All right, so you made it. Wake up. You're back. Here we go. You know what apologetics is. From here on out, we explore why Scripture says it's so important. Now, if you remember last week or two weeks ago, I preached on distractions and all those things, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and all these distractions that want to pull us away from following a heartfelt relationship with Christ. In 1 John, you remember we talked about that? And we looked and we saw that the world system today is not your friend. The world system is not going to encourage you to be a follower of Jesus. Hopefully, you are living a life so committed to Christ that when you walk out that door, you feel the tide pulling against you. You should feel a little cross current of, well, that's not what we learned in here, and this is not what I'm seeing out there. You should sense a little bit of friction if you are salt and light. Does that make sense? You should feel, remember, the culture is never neutral. Remember that. The culture is never neutral. It's not just going to sit by, and it certainly isn't going to applaud you. Well, you stood up for Christ at work today. I'm so glad. We're going to have a break room meeting, and you're going to share the gospel. <laughs> Probably hadn't happened a whole lot. Do people applaud you when you stand? No. That's okay. He does. We don't do it for these accolades. The culture, think of it like the tide. You're standing. You may not quite see it moving, but I guarantee you, I promise you, and I don't like the sand and I like the sweat, but I have been in the beach water just enough to know I wade out up to waist deep, I feel it. And it's either pulling me towards Christ or pushing me away. That's what the world system does. That's why it's important to know why we believe what we believe. One minute it's pushing you, one minute it's pulling. The world system and our culture is never just sitting still. It's never just sitting there saying, you could do what you want. You could be neutral. Knowing why you believe what you believe is so important, and we have to know God's word. Mary C. Riley, she wrote this fantastic article a while back. She says this. She says, without being deeply rooted in the word, it becomes so, 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 so easy for a believer to believe whatever sounds best about God. In other words, our culture has turned our theology into a buffet. This is so powerful. You know what a buffet is? Anybody ever visited one of those? They're going to have those in heaven. Buffets are awesome. 
except for when you're talking about theology, where you come up and you read through the Bible, you go, hmm, I have a little bit of this. Oh, and a little bit of this. Oh, I love that. That's brownies. Oh, yeah, I love that. I'm going to eat some of that. And oh, no, salad? Are you kidding me? That's, no, no, I don't, I, I'll just skip that part. I'm just going to tear that page out because it doesn't agree with me. That offends me. Church, that's a slippery slope. That is a slippery slope. I'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Oh, I don't like that. I'll skip that part. And we have whole denominations now that, it will, that are believing a lie, that have crossed over into apostasy, where they no longer stand on this. Like, you know what? That's not culture. That's not politically correct anymore. Let's just tear that page out. That makes me uncomfortable. I am not the editor of this book. We're the messengers of the book. I don't get to edit this because it makes me uncomfortable or because it spanks me in an area that I need to or convicts me in an area that I am not following Christ taught. It's supposed to have that authority to, whoo, that kind of stings just a little bit. But thank you. May I have another? And that's how we're supposed to feel when God's Word convicts it. Y'all remember Choose Your Own Adventure books? These are awesome. This is the first one right here. The Cave of Time came out in the 80s, which was the best era for music ever. You know, it's not even debatable. Just accept it. In the Cave of Time, we have the chance. If you don't like what's going on in your story, that's okay. Just pick a different ending. If you don't like that, back it up. Go back. You have multiple endings. You could literally choose and write your own ending. I don't like that. Oh, that's not good. That's what our culture wants to do with Scripture. That's why, You see why we have to know it? Somebody comes and quotes, oh, man, God helps those who help themselves. What? That's not in here. In fact, the way I read it, God helps those who can't help themselves. You see what's happened? It is hibbity-flippity. It's totally upside down. They've twisted that, and the devil is so good at that, and so many people don't know this word, they don't even refute it. They just go, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds good. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's in there too, right? It's in second hesitations. It sounds like it's believable. You say it with convincing, and it's unbelievable. We don't know this. That's why it's so important that we know the whole counsel of Scripture, not just the parts that make us feel warm and fuzzy. We conform to Scripture. Not the other way around. Man, that's good. That's not even, you need to write that down or tweet that out. We conform to Scripture, not the other way around. But the culture says, no, 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 no. I don't like that. You need to form your own opinion. Here's what happens when we do the buffet-style theology, when we don't know our apologia. Our theology becomes a vague, undefined, nebulous term, and we use it really to describe our own beliefs. Here's my theology. Well, you're right. It is yours because you've inserted so much of your own opinions. I know you love me, and I appreciate that, but you know what? My opinion doesn't mean squat. That opinion is what means something to me. And so we look at this. We see these symptoms of the world system. Another one, it's beautiful. Our culture has given us the concentration of a goldfish. This is, I, I wish this weren't true about me, but I see so much of me in this. Think about this. I go, I sit down on my sofa, and within five minutes, I will have opened 10 different apps. I will have checked three different email accounts. I will have replied to 17 different texts and read the first half of three articles while flipping through eight shows in my queue. I go, what? Squirrel, where? You know, and it's just, we just go. And we're so, we have the attention of a goldfish. It reminds me of this right here. This is, right, this is, I feel like Dory. And I realize that not one of those is a goldfish. But you get the point. You get the point here. This is, this is how we have done it. And what happens? We've applied this to our theology, church. And we get antsy. Reading any bit more than a verse? I don't got time for that. Pastor, don't you know this is the Twitter age? You got to give it to me in 140 characters or less or I'm gone. I'm out. Well, I don't have to read a whole chapter of Scripture? Are you kidding? We get antsy. What do we do? We start looking ahead like, where's the chapter break, man? How much more is this? I got to go, right? Only seven honest people in here laughed at that. That's true, though. You know you do that. You know you do it. There you go. There you go. It is incredible. We have the attention span of a goldfish. Here's another reason why we have to have a firm apologia. Because our culture would like for truth to be a sliding scale of gray. Get ready. <laughs> Buckle up, buttercup. We would like this to be a sliding scale of gray. Our culture says, quit your absolutes. It offends me. Quit this. You have absolute black and absolute white. and you, The culture wants different shades of like 49 or maybe 50 shades. 
of gray. What? All right, let's just have a little side note here. When a movie like that can come out and gross $100 million in 20 days, but we can't fund missionaries. When a movie like that can come out and we gross $100 million in 20 days and over half the people who are paying for it are professing born-again followers of Christ, then you know what happened? Culture is setting the temperature of the room, not the church. Think about that. Sliding scale of gray. You know why? Because if, if, if I don't have to be held to an absolute standard, I don't feel so bad. It, 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 don't, don't convict me here. Well, you know what? It's not my job anyway. It's the Holy Spirit's. But this is, this is it, absolute truths are absolute truths. But the world doesn't like that. Truth is not subjective. It is objective, and it is found in this book. Truth is not relative. It's not one of those things where you just get to make up your own. You get a relativist in here who says there are no absolute truths. Guess what he just did? He just made an absolute truth declaration. How ironic, how self-contradicting can you get? There are no absolute truths. Well, congratulations, you just made an absolute truth declaration. And they don't even know it. It is so laughable. This, our society, if we are not governed by absolute truths, if we as a church can't stand up and say, I'm sorry, I stand on this. This is, this is my right. This is my wrong. If we can't do that, society will implode, and it will continue down a slippery slope. Let me show you what I mean. Here's one of my favorite signs in the whole world, the stop sign. Let's just say for a moment that this stop sign in, in America no longer really meant absolute stop. Right? I mean, what if... What if, stop, what if that's not your truth? Well, for me, that stop is my truth, right? But, but who are you to judge that? Who are you to impose your morality on someone else? You see how laughable this is? How, what if the stop doesn't mean stop for me? Well, I'm just going to go right on through. No cop, no stop. I'm out of here. Here we go. Woohoo! Do you see what's happened? This is such a simple concept to grasp. When there are no absolutes... <laughs> absolute chaos reigns. Guess who thrives on chaos? Guess who thrives on lies and destruction? There's a murderer and a thief, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he is the adversary. We have to know what we believe, church. We have to stand on this book. It is unlike any other. 66 different books written over a span of 1,500 years, 40 different authors, living on three different continents, written in three different languages. Most of the authors never met another author. Yet, you tell me how it has retained such incredible unity and virtually no contradictions. And it was written over a millennium in length. Different people didn't even know each other, and they're saying the exact same thing. You can stand on the truth in this book. You can back it up with historical, archaeological, geographical, and even scientific evidence. And it is worth that. And I won't even go into all that. If you like that, go, go get my message on God Quest back in 2015 that walked you through why you can trust just the Scripture. It is, it is mind-blowing if you've never heard it. The Old Testament has proven to be 99% unchanged, un, un, unedited, and inaccurate when compared to Dead Sea Scrolls that we just found that dated back to, to I think, 300 B.C., if I'm not mistaken. And they compared it. The New Testament also proved out to be 99% accurate when compared to over 5,600 partial and complete New Testament that we were able to find all the way up to the first three centuries of, of A.D. It's unbelievable the mathematical improbability of that happening by accident. It, is, it boggles the mind. And I'm a science guy, so that kind of stuff resonates with me. But if it doesn't, maybe Lord of the Rings resonates with you. In the Fellowship of the Ring... Bilbo is talking to, I think his nephew, his cousin, um, and, he, and he's making this statement, and he says this. He says, it's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. That's the best British accent I've got. I apologize for that. That was, that was my attempt at that. Do you know, I want to focus on those three words on the second line from the bottom. Keep your feet. Do you know what that means? This is so awesome. It literally means when you stand up, you are counting on your legs holding you up. You are counting on your feet, not slipping out from under you or the tide that we talked about, pulling your feet from out from under you and you falling down. You are literally counting on keeping your feet under you. 
And that's exactly how it is with the Word. To keep our feet in this world requires us putting our weight upon that which is true. But we can't do that if we don't know this book. How do I defend something that I open once a week? If this is your only meal, you're going to be awful hungry. I can't feed us all in 29 minutes for a week. If this is the only time you check in with the Lord or you read a verse on Twitter and think, good enough, (laughs) you will have a very shaky apologia. And you won't be able to do what Peter said, give an answer for the defending of why you believe what you believe. Truth is not something we get to invent, church. It's not. Truth is found right here. God's promises are true. In fact, this scripture in Proverbs says every word of God proves true. The Holy Spirit leads people into truth, John 16. We're commanded to know the truth in 1 Timothy. We must handle the truth accurately. Yes, help us, Lord. We should avoid doctrinal untruths, 2 Timothy 2.18. Christ's disciples live by the truth. Are you a disciple of his? We have to live by the truth. Christ's disciples abide in the truth. It's the belt of truth that holds our spiritual armor together. God doesn't lie. He personifies truth. He is the God of truth. In fact, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the truth. He's all of it. He embodies it. He is the ultimate reference point shown in his revealed word. This is what allows us to evaluate every other truth claim, by the way, every other so-called path to God. This is what allows us to, to evaluate that and see if these truth claims are true. It's we who have to go to Scripture. God doesn't need to consult us to determine what's right and wrong. And we have that backwards. We are the ones who have to go to him. But our culture says, no, you need to appeal to whatever you feel is right today. Right? Let's take a vote. It's a democracy. (laughs) This is not a democracy. This is his book. It's his book. Go make your own universe and world. Then you can decide what you want to do. His world. His rules, and he knows what's best. This is, so, this is so incredible to me. It's God who appeals to himself, his ways, his holiness, his standards, his design. That's why we check in with that. Remember this, if you think of nothing else, truth is truth no matter how many people don't believe it. And a lie is a lie even if everyone believes it. Just because a thousand people believe a lie, it's still a lie. But we won't know it's a lie if we don't have an apologia based on this book. If we spend more time scrolling through our Facebook feed than we do on this, we don't know God's Word as well as we know what happened to our buddy who lives in Sacramento. That's a cute cat pick, by the way. I can't deny it. But at what cost is it robbing me of a greater study, a greater apologia? We have an option. We can listen to the world or we can listen to the Lord. The Christ, that we have the truth teller, and over here we have Satan the liar. Only one of them always delivers on his promises. I'll give you a hint. It's not Satan. It's not the adversary. Randy Alcorn put it this way. I love it. He says, unlike God, the devil promises without delivering. He is always denying, always revising, always spinning the truth and rearranging the price tags. Oh, that's so good. That sin don't cost much. You, nobody, hey, nobody's looking. That's a cheap one. This one, oh, murder. Well, we all know that's bad. We're going to swap. We're going to move these price tags. Oh, that is such a powerful, sick, twisted, demented vision of the devil working behind the scenes. Sin always costs more than he advertises. Know that. If you've ever taken a, a fall or you've done something that you later regret, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It always costs more than was advertised. The ramifications of sin. Jesus showed up and he said, Satan is a liar. In fact, he's the father of lies. And he goes on to say this in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue. You know what I picture? I picture a serpent's tongue. That little forked, that, you know. He, it's like he has the gift of parcel tongue, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. He's able to, to kind of twist things and, and do it. There's a comic strip that is so beautiful out, and it says this. You know how I can tell when you're lying? Your lips are moving. <laughs> so true. Jesus is like, hey, I know you're lying because you're talking. Satan speaks his native language. That's all he does. He's the father of lies, and when he talks, he is speaking his lies. And we have to be able to differentiate between what is truth and what is a lie. And when we speak... 
We need to speak life, and we need to speak truth. We need to speak Christ's language. See, the opposite is true. When we're not speaking truth, we're speaking Satan's language. Man, may I never be found speaking his native tongue. Half-truths. little shading of gray here to kind of skirt the issue. Oh, Lord, help us know the difference between your voice and the devil's false impersonation. We live in this time of internet gossip and tabloids and false advertising and made-up reality and fake news. How profound is it that Luke makes this observation? Read it with me in Acts. He says, Now the Berean Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures every once in a while. No? Daily. Every day. To see if these things are true. Every good preacher will say, man, I hope you're taking this out. I hope you're checking it out. I hope you're seeing if these things are true. This search, the Scriptures, notice what they did. It says they weren't skimming. <laughs> they skimmed the Scriptures daily. The Bible is the primary truth claim. There it is right there. And, and, y'all, let's just be honest. There's a lot of people, we forget this, there's a lot of people who died to get this book into your hands as we have it today. There's a lot of people who are dying today in our planet, brothers and sisters in Christ who we will meet in glory, who are dying, who are fighting for one page out of this book. One page. And if they can get a copy, tear it out, they will smuggle it home and they will read it in darkness with a candle because it means so much to them. And some of us own six or seven copies of this. And I wonder if we even grab one off the shelf. Man, that's powerful. How's your apologia? How is your defense of the gospel? As we read the scriptures, you're going to find something. You're going to soon realize the world system and the culture is going to say one thing, and God's word will often say something totally different. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Now what? What do you do? What do you do in that moment? Henry Blackaby calls it a crisis of belief. Beautiful. What do you do in that moment when you have your world and everything you've bought and everything you've uh, swallowed telling you this is true, and God's word comes along and says, actually, that's not. You've been, you've been sold a lie. Well, here's your challenge. You ready? Get your pens out. This is going to challenge us just a little bit, okay? I hope this encourages you. It's not meant to sting, but this is a simple test that we can take to see if Scripture truly is the authority in your life. Are you ready? To see whether Scripture is in the authority of my life, ask this first question. Am I willing to accept his truth even when my life would be easier, even if it's just for the moment, if I didn't? Am I willing to accept his truth when not accepting it would honestly be easier? You know what that's called? A convenient Christian. God, I'll follow you. I'm all in. I surrender all. Well, not that part because I don't like that part. I surrender. See what I'm saying? you get past that, move on to question number two for your challenge. Do I believe it even when it's contrary to what I've always believed or wanted to believe? Well, pastor, now you've just gone to meddling. Wish you'd back up on that. I talked to my wife. I have permission to share this story. When we were dating, (laughs) because I'm smart, I got permission to share this story. When we were dating, we we didn't always agree on some things. I was a third year... uh, Bible student. She was a pre-med student. I wish I could honestly say I looked at her and I was attracted to her spirituality first, but I was attracted to her exterior, and then I wanted to get to know her beliefs. And as we would drive in the car, we would have conversations, and inevitably, God's Word would come to the picture, and we'd say things, and I'd be like, that's not what God's Word says. This is why we believe this and this. And she's like, no, not right. She told me, this is like years later, she told me she would go home and she was so mad. She would get out her Bible. She'd be like, there's no way that that says that. He is such a narrow-minded, racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobe. I can't believe this guy. What? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm so mad. He was right. Think about this. You laugh (laughs) because we've been there. God's word is a mirror. It is a sharp sword. There are times where I look and I'm like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm not. I need to be more like Jesus in this area. 
And it's a mirror, and it holds up to me. And it's not just Amy, and she is a godly, awesome, loving wife and, 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 and a great role model for, for our children and for, for many. But originally, we had to have a crisis of belief where we looked and said, that can't be right. That's not what I was taught in my church. That's not what I was taught by somebody I looked up to. And it ended up being, they were being taught man's best guess on some things. And they didn't consult the, the foundation. They didn't consult the owner's manual. So if you can get past that, ask yourself this question. Do I allow God's word to convince me to believe what I don't like? Is, is, is that, can I do that? And if so, can I believe it even when it offends me? Man, that offends me. I don't, I don't want to give that person my, my coat, Lord. I don't want to go the second mile. I am tired. I know I should share with this. I know I should do this. And, and, and Lord, here's the other side. Let's not forget this. I know I should stop doing this. That's my, that's my precious. That's my pet, my pet sin. And if you really are ready to take the last step, here's your final challenge. In other words, ask yourself, am I truly his disciple? Ultimately, am I willing to bow my knees before him and let his word shape my heart and my life? Only you can answer that. I try to get to the point in my life where I answer yes to that. Doesn't matter what I've been taught. Doesn't matter what I believe. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what I think is right if it goes against this. I can't call myself a person of the book if I don't live by the book. There was a story of a guy who was, <laughs> he was doing his best to share truth. He was dressed like Jesus. He was on a street corner, a busy downtown U.S. city. And two guys were getting ready to walk by him, and he noticed a crowd starting to swarm around this guy. And he was in his face. He's like, repent, sinner, the end is at hand. And he was just going, and he was quoting great facts, and probably he was accurate. But the way he did it was horrendous. In fact, the two guys said, man, we got to intercede. We got to go stop this guy. They were brothers in Christ. They were, they were believers. Like, even though he's preaching the truth, we got to go stop this guy because he's going to get beat up because all he's doing is quoting facts and knowledge and laying out his apologia, but he's doing it, here's the warning, without love. He was wielding his Bible as a sword. And he could go through. They went on for 30 minutes. Boom, boom, boom. He had every memorized reason. He had everything do, 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 just lined up. He had his defense. He had his apologia. But here's the problem. He had no grace. He had no love in his heart. And grace towards people will always trump knowledge. So hear me, for the next two weeks when we study apologetics, you're going to learn a lot of facts, and it's going to give you some great confidence but that's not enough. Grace is what makes you effective in sharing God's truth and God's love. May we never, Paul said, knowledge puffs up, but it's love that builds up. So hear my warning. As you start to learn some of these deep truths and you start building an apologia that you are confident and you can share and you can answer that question, I'm a 10. Put that post-it on my forehead, pastor. I am ready to give a defense. Make sure we always do this in love. You remember what we talked about last week? Jesus was being tested by people, just like that preacher was. And the Pharisees came up, what is the greatest law? Tell us, tell us, what is it? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Oh, and by the way, there's one other one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. That is powerful. May our knowledge never puff us up. The next couple weeks, you're going to hear things. You're going to hear how to answer the question, do you really believe God created you? Do you really believe you're specially created? I thought my science proved this. You'll be safe here to bring your questions. Do you really believe God could create all this? How, how, where's your evidence, Christian? Do you know what you'd say? Easter's coming up. Two weeks from now, we're going to talk about, can you really understand what it means, why the tomb is empty, why that matters? Can you explain that? If someone says, prove to me, what is it? What would you say? Do you have your defense, your apologia? You will. This is so powerful. This is life-changing, some incredible truths. But none of this matters. None of this matters. If you don't know the author of the book, we can know all the facts all day long, but it comes back to your relationship with Christ. So in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. We like to close with a final song. If you don't know the Savior, and this is just kind of flying over your head, come talk to me. I'll stay late. You can come just make a quick run in with me. We'll set up a time that's good for you. Maybe this is just kind of going over your head and you don't really understand this commitment. Ask your questions. We're here for you, okay? It is time. Casual Christianity won't cut it anymore.
All right, let's pray together. God, I thank you for the power of your word and the simplicity of truth. It cuts like a two-edged sword, and God, I am so glad it does. It is exactly what I need to spur me on to a deeper walk with you. I thank you that your word never returns void. I thank you that so many times today we can laugh, and in the next moment you are speaking to us, you could hear a pin drop. I thank you for your power. Lord, would you open our hearts and do the Holy Spirit surgery that only you can. I pray that you would just lay us open and that you would have your way in our hearts and our minds. You have showed us truth today. May we respond the way you want. We pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen.